everybody. It's good to, to see you and welcome, Darlene. It's good to see you again. Been a while. Been a while. Uh, yeah. And um, so we've been working on the farm uh, COVID-19 uh, relief money and, along with food services and, and 50 other things. Um, and uh, so this morning we thought we would hear from the farmers because we haven't heard from you folks since the governor came out with his proposal. And, uh, and that it's all gonna be part of the, the mix. We sort of had our own that we were coming along with. And, and uh, so anyways, we're, we're gonna be putting together a plan to submit to our uh, appropriations committee. And uh, we've got, you know, a week and a half or two weeks to do that in. Um, so if you'd like to lead off this morning of how things are and what you think of, of the whole uh, fiasco in general, um, that would be great. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you, Bobby. Uh, my name is Darlene Reynolds. Uh, I own and operate Crosswinds Dairy and Daughters in Alberg, Vermont. Uh, my husband and I and my two daughters run the farm and we milk probably around uh, 600 to 650 cows all the time. Uh, we're an MFO. Uh, I, I don't know if most of you remember, I was the chair of the Farmers Watershed Alliance uh, for some time. Um, and uh, have uh, stepped down at this point, uh, but still uh, very engaged uh, with what lot goes on in our communities around me. Um, I think I have a really healthy relationship with everybody in our community, which I always appreciate because I, I uh, have not, I've been one of them farmers have been lucky enough not to have any phone calls and stuff like that. So it's always good to have the quietness. <laughs> um, but uh, definitely covert 19 has changed my business dramatically. Uh, I gotta say that uh, I, cannot believe the change that we have made since early March um, and very unexpected, almost to the point where by the time the reality set in, it was almost too late for our farm to kind of jump on that reaction. Um, we uh, have been a farm that's always uh, purchased insurances um, the last five years. And I, shockingly, we, for the first two quarters of this year, had none because we just felt that the year was gonna be great and that we were gonna be able to move forward and start paying back some debt and, and uh, really uh, hopefully put our farming in a standing where we could take and bear the next downturn. Cause you know, it always usually does happen. Um, and uh, it was, a, it's an exciting time for us. I have a daughter who just graduated from UVM with a bachelor's degree uh, in animal science with a minor in entrepreneurship. Um, very super excited and I had to mention it because there is no ceremonies no graduation um, and very proud of her. Um, and I have another daughter who's 26 years old who's currently on the farm with me who has come leaps and bounds since she's graduated. And I, also to let you know, both of them were recipients of the two plus two program. I've got to put that out there and always appreciate that program. Thank you very much. Um, and, and going in COVID, hearing the governor speak last week about potentially or ex it happening to help us dairy farmers get through COVID-19 was super, super exciting. Um, I don't know how I'm gonna pay my vendors. I don't know where this money's coming from. The drop has come so significant and so dramatic that I'm here now looking at the end of May, you know, trying to put a game plan together and everything has happened, had to happen so quickly. You know, running to my, my companies for equipment, asking for deferred payments. Um, trying to figure out how to cut myself back on grain because not only did we get hit hard with prices, we also got hit hard with the fact that our cooperative is now asking us to drop 15% of our production very quick, like in, in a manner of only giving us one month's worth of production to do, you know, to, to look at. Um, and, and every day it seems to be new changes. Every day it seems to be new challenges, um, you know, and I, I think as a, as a farm, we've had a lot of family meetings. Um, we've had a lot of discussions on how we were going to work that out. Um, you know, plans on making deferred payments, plans on uh, taking and paying interest only on some of our loans, plans on where to cut staff if possible. 
Um, that was a little catch 22 because we were one of the ones that took uh, the uh, PPP monies. And then you're looking on where the cuts and that's not one of them because of the PPP monies. You need to ensure that your staff are continuing to be there. So that was a little interesting. Um, but trying to work through that, um, trying to work through where vendors are gonna get something if they can get something. I mean, at this point, um, I'm still looking for money to finish paying off the grain bill, even though at the beginning of the month, uh, our farm decided to cut back on grain. Uh, our farm de decided to develop a much more uh, locale uh, group. And our farm also decided to beef out several animals to try to help get the cut back, um, plus you know, decrease the cost of what's going on right now. Um, so, so with all that at hand, um, I, I'm looking into June in even lower milk prices. So we've, we've set the, the price for May at looking at to be around 1250 to 1275. And now they're looking at June to being even maybe 75 to a dollar less than that. Um, so, so, so moving forward, we're just trying to figure out ways all the time to try to, to mitigate the situation. We're also looking at uh, insurance programs for the fourth quarter and the third quarter of this year, if available. Um, have took a look at it. Very, very, very expensive. Um, uh, but looking at all those avenues, I feel like our dairy, I've got to say, has been one who's also been progressive on trying to do some diversification. Uh, my, my husband and my family do a lot of custom operating for other small farmers, especially the organic area, because we live in Grand Isle County, um, organic herds. Um, we also uh, take and uh, do a lot of uh, assistance with other things that goes on the farm to help out with that cash flow situation. Um, I, I just, I just want to let you know that what's happening now isn't because, you know, dairy farmers in Vermont are doing a bad job, or isn't because dairy farmers forget um how to be good entrepreneurs this is happening because it's happening everywhere to so the country and when you talked about this stimulus package um and i have spoke to the senate house ag and i guess that's why i'm jumping into this i want to let people know that every dollar that the state of vermont gives to us we're giving back to the vendors of the state of vermont that those dollars will quickly leave our farm if if they even hit the doorsteps for two seconds and run right back out to where those monies need to be um, to, secure, to secure, you know, the infrastructure that's going on here, to secure the people who, the automotive salesmen we buy filters for, for our tractors, to the dealerships we buy tractors from, to the grain companies where we get our grain, to the auto supply, you know, to the, the hardware store where we get lumber if we have projects we have to do. That money is the money that we're desperately missing right now. And um, this is a very expensive time of year for us. We're out there planting corn. Uh, chopping hay, trying to pay for diesel fuel, trying to keep people working um, because we are essential. You know, the bottom line is that this work still needs to get done. Um, and um, I also want to say too that most of my farm is land trusted. So this farm has always had the idea of being agriculture, to being in this community, and to and to making sure that Vermont stays the way that it is today. And I can't stress enough on how important these dollars are to every Vermont farmer that's here. Yeah, thank you, Darlene. <clears throat> Have you uh, any estimate on uh, the loss that you like suffered up to this point uh, from low milk prices to extra costs for in, because of culvert? Yes. Our dairy farm right now, um, for this last milk check and pushing forward, we are a little over a hundred thousand dollars loss. And that's medium sized farm. That is a medium sized farm. Yes. Yeah. And and, uh, it, and and also just remember, there's also other struggles other than the actual not being able to pay bills. Sometimes just getting services for the farm because of COVID nineteen has been difficult. So even though you know, our farms still have to run 365 days a year, you know, pretty much 24 hours a day. We need to make sure that that happens. And sometimes getting those services isn't as easy as it used to be because of COVID as well. So that yeah. incurs extra time, extra expense, you know, and, 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 and ingenuity. We have to think outside of the box to get what we need to get done on a daily basis. Yeah. Um. Other questions from the committee members? Um, no, and um, has any of the 
federal money come through yet to help you folks, darling? Nothing federally has come through for us. I don't know of any farmers um, myself that have gotten even the $1,200 stimulus check. Um, I do know that a lot of farmers applied for the PPP and gotten some monies. I do know a very, very few farmers who got a little bit of unemployment checks, but most of them have gotten none of them at this point in time that I know of. And as far as the USDA, the sign up for that particular program just started on May 26th. And yes, my application is already in because yeah. that, that's super important to me that that funds come uh, back to the farm as soon as possible. It's not an easy task though to get a hold of an FSA person to get that application in because they are so overwhelmed on the amount of applications that are heading into their office right now. I feel like I was one of the lucky ones that had an email and they answered it. So I just kept emailing back and forth until I got everything completed. And um, I, I know a lot of other people are still pushing to do that as well. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Are there any questions from committee members um, for Darlene? If not, thanks again, Darlene. Uh, Ruth? Just one quick question, Darlene. Um, thank you for your testimony. I don't think I've met you before um, and congratulations on your daughter. <laughs> um, yes, thank you. Um, I just wondered how many, just give me an idea of how many employees you have on your farm for a size, for an MFO size. Um, um, we probably have between eight and 12, depending on the day. Eight, and does um, that include your daughters and your family? Yeah, members? Two, okay. two, yeah, yeah. I have two daughters that work on the farm. I work full time. I actually milk one shift a day, six days a week on the dairy, as well as do the bucks here. And um, my husband uh, works on the farm, uh, helps out with feeding, but a lot of times he's gone doing the custom work with my daughter, Olivia. So the main people that are on the farm actually working with the herd is my oldest daughter, Serena, and myself. Okay, and which which cooperative do you belong to? I am a DFA member. DFA, and they're the ones that they've asked for a 15% reduction in your production? That is correct. We didn't get notification until around April 15th or 16th, and that, that it would start the decrease in production on May 1st. Um, I will let you know, I have not been accomplished able to accomplish the 15%. Uh, the, Good part is, is that not going to take away money away from me like Agrimar is going to try to start doing. I'm hearing that um, every hundred pounds that you overproduce in May and Agrimar, they're going to charge you $14. Um, uh, in May, though, uh, with my overproduction, I can get paid anywhere from $2 a hundred weight for that milk to possibly as much as $7 a hundred weight, but no more. For the overproduction? For the overproduction. Over. And did you, you mentioned that you um, called some animals? Were you able to get a decent price for the beef for those? Or the last couple of weeks have not been bad. There was a like two or three week gap beforehand that the prices actually went down. Um, I I uh, think uh, for decent hey. beef right now, you can get around seventy to seventy one cents for a very good cow. Um, and as little as 50 cents. So it has come up a very, a little amount, probably about 11 to 12 cents per hundred, uh, per pound, um, mm -hmm. which has been really helpful um, in meeting the demands of trying to make, for at least my farm, for trying to make payroll on the weekly basis um, because of the deductions of the advance checks that the cooperatives um, have come out with because they're so low. Um, without those beef checks, it would be even more extremely difficult. So your cooperative is doing deductions on your your uh, your milk checks. Absolutely, yeah. um, they 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 take and um, you know give you a final paycheck and then they do an advanced paycheck and that advanced paycheck has been hit dramatically hard on on how little that you're going to get paid versus the next month. Um, it, it's it's. It's, it's pretty serious when you start having conversations with your milk company and, and they're basically asking you to take off all of your non-mandatory non milk check assignments off your check. Yeah. They're saying that milk prices are so low that you no know, payments that we normally pay for you that are non-mandatory, you need to take them off your milk check because there probably won't be enough money to cover that. And that's exactly what happened. So they, my milk company stepped out and, and warned me um, because I'll be honest with you, just getting my head wrapped around this drop um, was not easy in the beginning. 
you know, you think of like a two to three dollar swing is think is the most that I've ever really seen on our particular milk check. And this swing was, uh, I think, around five to five fifty. Um, and then our milk company in particular added a covert 19 minus on our check. So we got paid a specific price, then minus 87 cents for covert 19 and minus 49 cents for the marketing assessment fee, which brought our check down to a significantly lower price before yeah. we started paying yeah. the bills. Okay, thanks right. for confirming that. That's what we had heard that they were doing a sort of COVID-19 reduction in the milk check. So that's, it's good. I mean, it's not good to hear, but it's, uh, <laughs> It's interesting to hear directly from you that that's actually what's happening in the field. So thank you and thanks for your testimony. Thank you. Have you, Darlene, have you talked with the directors of your co-op? Because what we're finding is, uh, you know, the supplies in the stores from yogurts to cheese to fluid milk are not there. I mean, uh, you know, the shelves are or empty is flying out the door. And why, you know, why is, is the price so low and there's no milk to sell to, to people? Uh, um, maybe we'll get into that from some other participants this morning, but. Uh, I, I can answer that question for you, dear. Uh, yep. I, I had the exact same question myself when that happened. And you got to remember that there's a lot of processing plants around the country. And each processing plant processes a different type of product of milk. And when the food service industry went offline, the processing plants that processed milk in the five gallon bags and the processing plants that made 40 pound bags of mozzarella cheese, they actually became overstocked in the amount of material that they had left that they already had made. So they had to shut down their productions. And even though we ramped up the yogurt places and, 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 and bottling milk, they couldn't ramp it up fast enough to get what was flying off the shelves um, mo moving. Plus they had to move the milk that was supposedly heading to the plants to produce these larger quantity packages back to the plants that were had to gear up for product. So there was a lot of transitioning and shifts. So it was like a yin and a yang in the beginning. First, we had milk just flying off the shelves and actually milk was actually just driven into every place and then we had this over flush that everything had to be pulled back again and yeah. and that's what I was told and I kind of I kind of can relate to that because every plant I'm sure processes packaging differently than a different than a plant before that yeah there's a lot to it that's for sure uh well thank you uh Darlene and we'll move on because we've only got about an hour and a half so uh, thanks a lot for your time, and we'll move over to Will uh, Gladstone. Uh, morning, Will. Uh, morning. I are you Walt Gladstone's son? Yep, that's correct. Well, when Linda told me that Will Gladstone was going to be on, I said that name doesn't sound quite right. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it's great to uh, to have you. Uh, on and say hello to your dad and mom. Yeah, will do. No, well, I appreciate uh, being able to be a part of this this morning. Um, oh man, it. Uh, I mean, I'm gonna sound kind of like a broken record to what Darlene just said. She did a really good job. Um, so I'll give a little background about myself. I'm 31, uh, partners with my parents and my younger brother on our farm in Bradford, Vermont. Um, currently we're milking about 15 to 1600 cows. Um, someone asked about employees. We have, we have about 26 full-time employees on the farm at the moment. Um, and uh, we also grow about 200 acres of pumpkins as a diversification piece uh, to our business. Um, as far as COVID-19 goes, um, uh, you know, at the beginning of this year, end of the following year, it looked like we were going to have a great year. Um, we have Darlene and those folks sound like they've done a better job than us as far as participating in insurance programs. We, we, we used to do a little bit of, um, a little bit of futures contracting, 
We mostly contract our grains, but we have not done any um, milk in recent years. So we're we're totally unprotected. Um, and uh, and I think someone told me the other day only four percent of the state at the moment is uh, protected under some type of uh, insurance program. So um, most of us are pretty well wide open and, and vulnerable to what's going on. Um, so our we we ship our milk to Agrimark, and uh, the day before the first day of May. We knew it was coming, but we didn't really know what percent and what the penalty was going to be. Um, but they they sent out a letter at four o'clock in the afternoon, an email um, saying we have to reduce production uh, by six percent of March's milk for the month of of May and going forward until this pandemic, until they can get milk sales up again. Um, and the penalty, so what they're actually going to do is they're going to pay us full price for all of our milk, but the, the last 6% overage um, is going to be uh, docked $14 a hundredweight. So for May, actually, they're going to charge members based on what uh, most producers will be under that $14 range. Um, so they'll actually charge us to pick up the milk. So I, I know many, many producers that are going to um, couldn't couldn't reduce completely the six percent, just like Darlene had mentioned, and um, uh, field staffs actually quite concerned. Um, I talked with um, Vice President of Membership yesterday. They're actually pretty concerned because there's so many producers that are going to open up the valve per se on Sunday and. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of half empty milk trucks running around the countryside because people are going to dump their milk because they don't want to have it charged to pick it up. So um, that's kind of what we're what we're facing on the COVID side. Like like Darlene had said, prices look to be extremely depressed in, for May's milk. So that would be June's milk check, and and really going forward. Um, it's very uncertain. Uh, the markets have been so, so volatile the last uh, month or two, really. We've had major swings from from limit down, which is 75 cents a hundred weight in a day to limit up uh, certain days. So there's, um, it, it's really hard to know what, what our milk prices are gonna look like going forward. And, um, what is going to happen whether we have a second wave of of this or not um but in the in the short run uh dairy farmers uh desperately need those those monies to pay vendors to continue to pay on their operating line potentially um so it's 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 definitely going to hit many many farmers very very hard yep so the fourteen dollar charge is that on on the six percent or how is that how is that determined uh, will that that's correct so basically like for us and I'll give you some real numbers we we were making about a hundred and fifty three to one hundred and fifty two thousand pounds a day we are only allowed to ship right now at the moment 141,500 pounds so anything over that amount is going to be uh subject to to the $14 penalty and it looks uh, like from what agrimark uh in talking with our directors that's going to be for May's milk definitely for June's milk and they're just very unsure of how quickly they're going to be able to, um, you know, uh, loosen the reins per se on, on, on that penalty. So it's roughly what eleven thousand pounds reduction per day. Yes, you've got to reduce. So, you know, for thirty days. 
that's um, 333,000 pounds of milk a month. That's correct. That's quite a few trailer loads. Yeah, so we're we're figuring it it uh, it's going to end up being about three and a half to four trailer loads of milk. Correct. And and what can you dispose of that on your fields in your pit? Uh, what what do you do with that much milk? I think a lot of people are going to put it in their pits. That's correct. I think that you know. Uh, Obviously, the state probably will get involved in certain uh, operations, maybe to, and I'm sure producers will be talking with um, different people to make sure that that happens in an appropriate manner. But yeah, I, I think that there's going to be some of that. And I think some producers will, will probably end up shipping the milk um, and taking the penalty. There's, there's probably been a lot of producers too that have cut back their their milk by either feeding less grain, calling cows, um, drying off cows early. And, and all of these decisions are, are um, as you well know, unprofitable decisions on top of uh, a low pay price. So it's kind of a double whammy. Yeah, yeah. Uh are there any other markets out there for the milk, like down south, or or is it the same regardless where you go in the country? Um, I can tell you uh, just from talking with a few of my friends that are in Wisconsin, it, it's worse in certain areas than others. Um, we are lucky we are in an area that has quite high class one utilization, which would be fluid milk. Um, in Wisconsin, where there's a lot of generic cheeses that are made to grind into, um, you know, bulk uh, or bulk cheeses, there were, there were numerous co-ops out there that were asking producers to reduce 15 to 20%. Um, oh. Yeah. yeah. And there's certainly no spot market milk, right? Everybody's well, got not, not really. So, I mean, the, the spot market deal is kind of a tricky thing, too, because, um, you know, Agrimark, uh, as well as DFA, markets milk to many of those vendors. So, uh, contractually, we actually cannot sell our milk directly to other um, processors. Um, that It's not what we're supposed to do. That's... But yeah. there's there's a lot of produ there's a lot of processors right now that are buying milk for you know very very uh, small amounts of money six yeah. seven dollars a hundred weight distressed milk yeah yeah um, the uh, are there any questions from the rest of the committee uh, Rose. Chris can go ahead. I, I took last time. Go ahead, Chris. Um, well, thanks, Will. Um, do you do you think that we're likely to see some farms closing in Vermont? That that this will be the break the the breaking point for more of our farms? So oh, there's no question about it. I mean, yeah, you know, um, you know, when we're talking. Um, 12 13 14 dollar class three prices um our our break even on our farm to cash flow and have debt repayment um we're, we're somewhere around that 18 dollar 100 weight range so um and and we're probably you know we're we're a large farm permit um so i mean we're probably maybe marginally a little more efficient than some other producers and and that's that's what it that's what it takes for us to to make a hundred pounds of milk. So uh, I think for sure there's going to be a lot of people who are going to exit. Um, there's one thing that's interesting that these co-ops have made happen is bases transferable. So um, there's been quite a few farms that um, have sold out, and their their base milk production is transferable if that producer buys their cows. 
um, if that makes sense to you. So if let's <laughs> say you're milking 100 cows and you want to sell out and uh, right now uh, the price of dairy cattle is terrible, right? Because milk prices are poor. You might be able to get a premium for your cows because I want your base. I want to be able to make that milk without a penalty. So, um, which, which I think was positive that the co-ops are letting that happen because it's giving producers who want to exit a chance to uh, get more value for their cattle. Um, but that's, we're, we're definitely going to see more farms exit the business this year for sure. It strikes me that it's sort of tragic news on the back of several years of hard news. And, and Oh, there's no question about that. And so from the, from our seats, you know, in the Senate agricultural committee, we're trying to figure out how to help farmers that are uh, struggling to pay the bills. Um, but we also are trying to figure out, well, what do we do for the folks that are closing or to sort of help help with transition? And, and the moment we talk about that, people are frustrated because we they, they maybe hear us giving up on on farmers that are, you know, giving it their all to say the least and have been for years. And, and that that is, you know, we, we deal with that, that's fine. But I would love to to hear any ideas that you would offer us as we try to navigate that a little bit, recognizing that this is going to mean um, farms are closing and are there roles for us, for the state to play to help transition? We want to keep that land working. We want to keep it open land um, and in agriculture. And so any strategies for us, just, just even on how we should be talking about it so that people get the sense that where we are coming from, which is a supportive place, but also recognizing it, we do seem likely to lose some farms and, and we want to kind of help that happen in an orderly way that protects paychecks and, and people's investments. Well, I think that there's no question right now, people are more concerned about where their food comes than ever, ever. And um, we, I mean, I don't have the silver bullet. We grew 32 acres of hemp last year and still haven't been paid for 99% of it. So I think that, um, you know, diversity can work in some, in some ways you kind of got to be clever about how you, how, you know, how as the state, you guys, how much you want to push certain new ideas. Um, I think that there, there are, depending on the land base size, and what's going on um and and there there can only be so much farm to table i think but um we started selling uh about a month and a half ago beef off of our farm and um i can't believe we, we've sold probably 20 dairy call cows um and and a bunch of that we've sent to a processor and been selling at retail i i'm floored at how many people and and I'm sure that this is just a snapshot in time that, um, but I think that there's, there's definitely opportunities out there. Um, I think though, probably still our bread and butter is going to be these dairy farms continuing to work the land. And I guess my advice would be to you guys is um, I think that the folks that are left milking cows, um, I think that we're moving into a new era, like Darlene had kind of said, where these tools and insurance programs um, are gonna play a much larger role in establishing a bottom. Um, I, I don't have a silver bullet for you. I think that don't have all your eggs in one basket probably is yeah so i know you mentioned earlier uh will that you do a couple hundred acres of pumpkins uh and that that's quite a few jack-o'-lanterns and things uh, are you going to do more this year or uh, i mean how's that market uh going up to this point 
so far, um, so we, we sell pumpkins to um, probably 80% of our pumpkins only go to two people. Um, Market Basket and um, is, is a huge customer of ours. And then uh, we sell to a distributor who goes into Lowe's, Home Depot and Walmarts. And um, um, I think that, you know, those guys seem to think that they're going to be able to get the job done. And I, I sure hope so. I think that, I hope that people are still going to go out and want to buy a pumpkin or two for their for their children to carve. And um, so we're, we're, we're growing about the same number of acres as, as we always have. I don't think we totally had the courage to do more. Um, uh, but no, it, it's, it's been a great business <laughs> for us, um, especially in, in years when dairy really has fallen short. Yeah, well, that's great that you've got at least that market that's somewhat positive anyhow um well any other questions for will if if not thanks a lot for your time will i know you you're welcome to do like most farmers um so um is it um the next one to speak is it uh donna are, are you um are you all set? Can you hear me? Yeah, you sound loud and clear. Oh, yay. Uh, it's Dina Benjamin. Um, I don't really have anything more to say than Darlene and Will said because they did such an awesome job. Um, but I'm just here to, 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 to back up everything that they said and um, the urgency of, of getting the, the, the funds uh, right to the dairy farmers, that would be great. A couple of strategies that we used at our farm is we went um, from milking three times down to two times. And that, um, the way it figures, is probably a 9% production loss. Um, we also deferred all our long-term loans to August. So that's... Uh, a little bit of a relief but as it stands right now for us that in in january we were current with all our vendors um no longer current we're, we're running one to two months behind they've been fantastic but you know like darlene said that that only goes so far um we employ uh, about 10 full-time employees um we're able to meet right now our paycheck and our payroll expenses but that is absolutely it. You know, it stops at payroll and I'm thankful to be able to meet those. Yeah. And how many, how many uh, animals do you have, uh, Dana? Oh, yep. Sorry about that. Um, so we milk roughly around just shy of 500. We have a total head of about 950. And so our, are you a medium farm? Are you a medium yeah. or LFO? medium nope, we're an mfo yep oh yeah and you're out of uh franklin we're we're in franklin we have about a thousand acres here in east franklin yeah um are there questions for dina um so uh you by reducing your brian <laughs> Oh, I, thank, thank you, I Mr. Had, Chair. Uh, so I'm just trying to keep track of numbers. Uh, Darlene mentioned that uh, they're an MFO and it was about a hundred thousand dollar loss. So I'm guessing Dina's probably in that range. And then I'd want to go back to Will and ask him as an LFO what he would put down for a number. It'll just help us kind of get a overall kind of number. Yeah, we that that we we run those numbers too. Um, so we're right around a, a hundred. Okay, and what about Will? Uh, I'm kind of spitballing because I think that it's going to change quickly because our advance is coming the beginning of next month, and probably a lot of us are going to be uh, pretty discouraged. Um, 
I'm going to say it's probably in that 160 range, 150, 160. Okay, thank you. Um, other, other questions? Um, if, if not, uh, we'll move on. Uh, Amanda, are, are you going to go next or Bill? I'm, I can go. I'm going to, I'm going to keep it real short. You guys have seen me a couple times already. I appreciate the ability to come back after the announcement. And, um, I just wanted to touch on a few things. Um, and I know, I know there's a lot to figure out in this industry and your committee is kind of the ones that need to do it. So I appreciate the mid to long-term, um, thinking ahead of time, and we would love to be part of those discussions, and we do have some ideas. One of the ideas I just briefly throw out before we get to the subject at hand, which is the, the, the CARES money here um, before us, but I really feel with um, these other generations coming on board, um, I have two sons that are coming on board here in January, God willing, and Darlene has uh, three daughters, one who's um, actually going to be a, an attorney, but two, uh, four daughters, two are on the farm and one is still too young to decide and certainly will is the next generation and Dina has uh, a son and potentially a daughter. So I guess for me, something that, that this committee could really look at is offering some business consulting, you know, at a higher level to educate and to help these farms that are fully committed and invested not only with our dollars, but the money the state has put in. You know, we're running a lot of farms that have conserved lands. And if we are not here and we do not figure out what type of ag or the breakdown of different ag, that is an investment that our Vermonters have done um, for nothing. And also, if you consider the water quality investments we all have made and the state has made, if our dairy farms or types of agriculture are not here, that is an investment that will not pay off. I can tell you that right now, uh, there is an increased demand for housing. If you haven't heard that already, houses are flying off the market. Um, we have some lots, I'll be honest with you, that we were not going to develop, that we are now looking at putting out for sale as a way of helping us through this time. I know uh, up in your county, Senator Starr, there was some people from Connecticut driving by. They stopped at one of the farms and said, hey, do you know of any places for sale? We wanna get out of Hartford, we're looking. Um, and that is the real, that is the real story that's happening now. And I am all for um, new people coming to Vermont. It helps our tax base gives some re resurgence and maybe some workforce. But at the same time, I don't think that we want to um, offer <clears throat> our work landscape as that, as that, you know, I think we want to look and plan where the housing goes. So I just wanted to touch really quickly on those few things. But in general, I guess my request to your committee is um, to keep the uh, bill simple and not uh, not get into many different bills, many different versions to expedite the funding to the farms as they need it now, our vendors need it now, and we are not gonna hold on to it. It's gonna go right back out in the economy. Um, I think that our proposal of the 42 million prior to the governor coming and announcing his package is still pretty accurate. We're still looking at about a $7.50 loss per hundredweight, no matter what size dairy farm you are. And we had come up with 14 million a month. I think that's fairly accurate. I think we probably should look at the numbers again and forecast, you know, where are we gonna be at with the loss of farms and the production in the state of Vermont over the next month or so, and come up with another funding request uh, potentially in the fall. Um, and I think there is time for discussion on diversity and um, restructuring that needs to happen. And that's why we put in some considerations for mid and long-term goals, which we haven't had a chance to discuss with you yet. But 
you know, really what we're trying to do is build that bridge and the hard work that we put in the last four years, let us get to the other side so that then those things can happen. I know that, and I think, I don't know if Will said it this morning in your committee, but in the house committee, you know, they had capital projects planned. And I think most farmers did. We had water quality projects we had saved money for, we had uh, capital improvements and diversities that we were planning. That money now is gonna go into offsetting the COVID losses. And mm -hmm. that money is borrowed. So they're not going to loan us more money <laughs> to, to do these projects. And that is really kind of sad for the state of Vermont because you know, when you look at a uh, better year of milk prices and you've done the work of cutting your cost of production, you're building more cash reserves. And so we're gonna put it to good use and we're gonna become more efficient and do these things, but now those projects will not happen. So again, you know, whatever questions you have for us, we'd be happy to answer if you need some more numbers. Um, Senator Starr, we'll get those to your committee if that's helpful. But I just yep. really would request that this get done as soon as possible and get out the door because <coughs> farms are closing and they're not necessarily the farms that you want to consider closing. They, they, are, they, they are the farms of the future, but they just can't seem to figure out how to get through um, with this cash flow shortage. And they're not going to have the vendors hold any more money than they already did. Well, and a lot of vendors, a lot of vendors have not extended any more credit as we understand it. Right. I think we heard, Ruth? I think it was 200 million in unsecured um, funding, yeah. uh, the grain companies, you know, and, and that's scary. And they have employees and their money recirculates in the state of Vermont as well. Fuel purchases, purchases, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so you're right. I mean, this is this is this is a tsunami that nobody could plan um, and hit, and now we're all left trying to deal with the aftermath. Well, and you take as things go, you have no choice where you're going to sell your milk. Basically, you got two buyers, as far as I know, and. You don't want to get the grain dealers down to two or you know what will happen to the price of grain. Right. And, uh, you know, it, it's a darn vicious circle and and you get caught up in it and it's, it comes to bite you. Uh, right. Ruth, I think you had your hand up. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Bobby. Um, and Amanda, thanks for your testimony again. Um, I was struck by the first thing you started with, which was the need for business um, consulting services or training for especially new farmers. Um, and um, I appreciate that you said that. I think that um, our conversation a few weeks ago that um, maybe sparked a little controversy around the state, um, we were trying to figure out, you know, what is it that farmers need? Um, and in terms of consulting services or, um, you know, continuing education or professional development or whatever you want to call it. Um, and, uh, you know, we uh, were talking about some kind of uh, survey that would be, um, that would come with the, the, you know, check to say, what is it that you do need? Um, can you fill out the survey and let us know? And if you need business consulting services, then we will know moving forward that that's something we need to invest in or provide funding for, or, you know, uh, beef up the ability to, to, to offer that to farmers. Um, I've heard from farmers down in my area in Addison County that the same kind of thing that business consulting services would be helpful, especially for new farmers. Um, so I'm wondering what your thoughts on, are on if, if we were to, you know, include some kind of, you know, five question survey about what are your needs moving forward so we can make sure that we um, come out of this crisis as resilient and strong as possible. And we need to hear from you, not just you guys that are able to come on to our Zoom meeting, but farmers all around the state. So what are your thoughts on something like that? I mean, I think it's fine to collect data for sure. I wouldn't want it to hold up anything. I wouldn't want it to hold up um, any kind of funding. And I, I'd be really crystal clear on, on what I'm thinking for business consulting. 
I think it's education around booking floors and purchasing this, what we're calling as insurance. I think it's really education around how do you book grains? You know, I, I think it's really specific to building budgets and dairy profit analysis. I think it's really um, forward thinking. And I think it's really having somebody available where you can say, this is my, um, this is my thinking around this potential investment. Help me crunch the numbers. Um, you know, this is the forecast for next year. What kind of budget? I mean, it has to be that specific. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I get a little concerned sometimes when we pre present these ideas because I think, you know, it's, it's not just new farmers. You know, I think we're all young enough to learn a new trick, right? Yes, we're all, I agree. <laughs> you know, God help my husband. He's struggling with the smartphone, but he's, he's going to get it. He's going to get it. But um, you know, dairy today is so different. And, um, I, I think it needs to be really like, I, I'm going to throw out a couple universities and no, apologize. I don't want to, you know, offend anybody, but you know, Cornell has some great programs and they have great people available, you know, and, and New York has the dairy center of excellence. Like there, we don't have to recreate, we don't have to make it only a Vermont, you know, I think that we can partner and it will be a lot less expensive and they're already doing it. And I'll be honest, our family has undergone gone so many changes in the last four years because of that. And we utilize those things. And I just think, you know, that is something that could be helpful, but I don't want it to hold up any funding Gather information is great, but let's do it in a way that it's not tied to delay. That would be yeah. my only thing. Right. Well, we, not, uh, we got accused of that, but we never intended that. Yeah, I, and I, I, you know, we're trying as as uh, fast as we can. We're ahead of other committees <laughs> in terms of getting our package out the door. Um, the legislative process is obviously you know, not a fast one. We have uh, so many struggling businesses and organizations and individuals around the state that we're trying to help all at the same time. And I know that 1.525 billion sounds like a lot of money, but when you divvy it up with all the people and businesses that are struggling, it's really just not enough. Um, so we are making tough decisions and trying to do it as quickly as possible. But um, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Yeah, and it's, it's very hard to have it equitable too. You know, we're trying to figure it out so that, you know, the little guys get used fairly and the, and everybody in between up to the to the large guys get used fairly. And and you know, damned if you do and damned if you don't, you're gonna get criticized either way. But you know, I'm used to that because I been around for quite a while, but uh, some people, uh, their skin isn't quite as thick, you might say. Um, but anyways, um, any other questions uh, for Amanda? If not, thanks a lot again, Amanda, for giving us your time and thoughts. Uh, we certainly appreciate it. And uh, Bill, I guess you're up next. Okay. Morning. Well, good morning. I've been in the field all week and uh, we were covering a bunk at six o'clock this morning. I'm, I'm just sitting here kind of relaxing. Feels, feels good to sit down for a minute. Uh, nice to see everybody. Uh, look, we know you're working hard. We know you're trying to do the right thing. Uh, we understand that you've got a lot on your plates and, and there's a lot going on and it's hard to do everything by distance. In some respects, it's better, but in some respects, it's a little more difficult. Yeah. And, and I'm not gonna press you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna simply say thank you for your efforts. Uh, we appreciate your interest in dairy farms in Vermont. And, and we, we applaud you for the help you're offering. So, that's about all I have to say. Uh, I mean, I think I think everyone's spoken uh, enough about it so that I don't need to sit here and reiterate what others have said. 
so I'll, I'll just simply thank you and uh, uh, we'll be looking for your next uh, next call you'll you'll need some help further down the road probably so uh, I, I should tell you uh, I've talked with a couple of people uh, you may want to be talking to some banker type folks and one of the people I spoke with was the FSA director who would be able to do something uh, if you needed testimony on, on uh, a financial issue. Another one was uh, uh, David Lane and also Brenda Frank with uh, Yankee Farm Credit. Uh, and I think they may have reached out to you, Senator Starr. Um, if they haven't, they will be. So I, I told you I'd do that. And I'm, I'm yeah. going up to let you know that that's been... Uh, I've looked into that and they, they have your numbers. Yeah, thank you, Bill. Mm -hmm. Hey, uh, before we move too far ahead, you want to give me Brian's phone number so I can give him a call and try to get him to keep you out in the field more often because you usually aren't this quiet and reserved. You, you know, uh, he has a restricted number as far as you're concerned, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> you you like that you like that quiet side of me, do you? Well, no, I not. It's just different. <laughs> you know, I I was in the trucking business with you for quite a long time there, and and we had to fight a little for what we got. You know, and, it was a constant kind of, battle. Yeah, yes, it kind of uh, carried over into agriculture, didn't it? <laughs> Yeah, you jump from the fire, uh, from the pan right into the fire. Um, you know, that old guy in Maine said about those lobsters that they were, they were putting them in that boiling water, and the old guy said to the kid, well, they get used to it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess. Um, are there questions uh, for Bill uh, from any of the committee members? Um well, I don't see any hands up, Bill, and uh, I certainly uh, want to thank you, all of you, and uh, for your time. Uh, I know we've used up quite a bit of some of your time in the past, and and it's always been appreciated, and uh, it, it really helps us understand uh, the difficulty firsthand of where you folks are, what you're facing, what you're going through. And uh, we, um, you know, we're hopefully not this week coming, but the following week, we're supposed to have this stuff done and, and uh, get it out the door. Yep. And uh, we had a good meeting uh, earlier this week with Anson and the agency, and they're getting geared up to uh, get the money out themselves. And uh, so, damn it, hopefully in a, in a week or so, um, two weeks, you'll get some relief uh, coming. Uh, n nothing from FSA though, right? Yeah, Not but yet. they but you guys all got signed up and farmers are signing up and right and uh, I oh Amanda I did want to comment on those flatlanders mm -hmm. blowing in up here in Orleans County it's it's unreal uh, mm -hmm. driving along they're just stopping by a, a plot of land to get away from the city and uh, I don't know they think we're giving it away cheaply so i guess everybody's got jacked their price a little um did you folks have any other questions for us if if not uh, again uh, thanks a lot to all of you for your time and, and energy well thank you all have a good thank weekend you. folks thanks everyone thank you yeah good luck so committee, um, we still have uh, uh, about 15 more minutes that we can um, we can um, work on on the bill or or 
Uh, did we have anything else on the schedule, uh, Linda? No. No? Uh, so uh, this morning on the, at the chair's meeting, uh, earlier this morning, um, it, the plan sort of is that we'll do the ag, ag stuff on this recovery money and that we will uh, put together our plan uh, and, and then move it uh, to the appropriations committee and uh, where hopefully our plan will be pretty well intact so it can just be slid into uh, the big bill. Um, and the thinking behind that is that we have to have a central place uh, to keep track of the money so it doesn't get over overspent. And of course, everybody's concerned about what may happen um, down the road. Uh, if there's going to be more problems uh, later in the year and and so they don't want to get rid of all the money um, until we find out whether there's going to be more money. So I think our we're back we're back somewhere to our numbers more than, Anson's numbers um, and and hopefully though we ought to set this up I think so that there could be a second payment in case more money comes in it would be all all squared away and and ready to go so we wouldn't have to fool with it um, the uh, it's amazing how much of that uh, 1150 $1, million dollars is is gone um, but um, I'm I think uh, Tim or somebody's gonna get sheets out to you folks um, when it when they get get it organized uh, but Chris you had your hand up I just wanted to uh... Thanks for that. And uh, I actually was glad for this morning's conversation, even though we'd heard some some of our farmers. I see Amanda may still be here, but, you know, it, it's helpful to have them be with us as this evolves a little bit. So I appreciate that. Um, I wanted to let everyone know I did talk to Senator Lyons about the Meals on Wheels and um, Food Shelf piece of what we were talking about yesterday they're very eager for us to uh work with them on that they haven't had a lot of testimony but they will um and so i left it pretty loose because i wasn't really sure what we were going to do and what they were going to do so bobby it may make sense for you to check in with jenny but the bottom line is yes they're happy to partner with us and happy for us to be thinking about that yeah. That said, I think you. I think it's going to make sense for us to get really clear on what would be my hope is that that does not come out of the ag uh, bucket of money. That that no. is separate. It's a distinct uh, need. It's an undeniable need, uh, but it is very different from direct assistance to farm businesses. So. Um, that needs clarifying or, or uh, and it's above our pay grade here, but not above your pay grade, Mr. Chair. So I just wanted to flag that as a good conversation, a good beginning conversation with Senator Lyon. Yeah, uh, and Rose? Yeah, I just wanted to add, I brought it up in the education committee yesterday too, and they're yeah. supportive of our efforts to take the lead on this and then just loop them in, you know, next week when we have language and a plan. Um, to on the school food issue as well. So uh, they thought it was great that we started working on it. Yeah, and you know, I, yeah, I fooled around with education a long, a long time. Uh, 
you know, locally and then in Montpelier in the Senate. Uh, and it it's challenging to my mind why, you know, it's costing so much, this culvert 19 is costing so much for K through 12 classes when they haven't been to school since March 10th or something. Uh, yeah, do you do you guys talk about that in education, uh, Ruth, or is that? Well, one of the reasons is because, as you probably know, eighty percent of the cost of of education is is uh, teachers uh, paying for teachers and staff, and even though the kids have not been in school, the kids have still been doing remote learning. So the teachers and the teaching staff have all been engaged in education. I can tell you for sure, and so can Chris, that this is happening in our households. Um, and um, so teachers are working and they're getting paid for it. And just like the farmers that we just heard from, school districts have contracts that they have to maintain and vendors they have to pay. So the busing contracts have continued and they've been using those buses to deliver food in most cases. Um, and they still have their building contra uh, you know, costs and things like that. So while there have been some savings, there have also been increased costs for things like technology. A lot of schools bought um, computers to, for kids' use and stuff. So I'm happy to talk to you more about it, but there are still expenses uh, related to running the schools, even though they're not in the schools physically. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, you know, there's in that sheet that we received this morning, um, you know, there's a lot of money tucked in in there for K through 12. I mean, it's uh, a long ways from what I would call pocket change. You know, it's it's major dollars, and and the healthcare industry, uh, you know, they're in there for a, a lot of money. It, it, I think yesterday I talked a little bit, maybe out of line about the, the big guys getting all the meat and the little guys are getting the bones and, and uh, you know, it, I don't know, maybe, maybe that's the way it has to be, but I really question, question that to some degree. Um, yeah, Chris? Well, uh, maybe this isn't the place, but I can't help myself. You know, I, to that point, the idea that we're going to give businesses, you know, whatever the grant is, $25,000 or something, and then bail out the hospitals um, in, a, in some kind of commensurate assistance without acknowledging that business owners are glad to scrape together a hundred grand of income and hospital CEOs are paid millions of dollars. Like th this, <laughs> this really bothers me. And, and I, I, I am wondering as, as this evolves, if this, if we could in a broader sense, not in agriculture, but maybe across the board, acknowledge that. And, and, you know, the pandemic has laid bare all of the inequalities and weaknesses of our economy in the, in the most blatant yeah. way. And uh, that's exemplified by the food lines and all and on and on and on. And if we don't, if we are not mindful and actually perpetuate inequality in our relief spending, then shame on us. And, and I, I, you know, it's gonna be hard. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying we won't do it a little bit but we ought to have that conversation and, and yeah, you know, um, spread some of the meat um, to, to everybody. If, if you carry out the chair's analogy. Well, that's always been my belief. Even, you know, I know that's totally off the, the subject, but you know, I had 35 employees and damn it. You know, I made sure they lived as good as I lived and and I had 35 happy employees that 
their great, uh, some of them, they stayed until they were grandfathers and their sons came and their grandchildren came to work for me. And if you use everybody fair, uh, you know, it, it works, it all works out great. And uh, so anyways, uh, yeah, that's going to be a battle, Chris, that, that I just soon be part of. Uh, and uh, the, um, but we've got a, I'm going to have another chat with, uh, with the powers to be in regards to our numbers. And uh, because we've got, then we've got to figure out, you know, how much do we put in the other farms? We, we've got, you know, our, our other farms that, that are bleeding well. And, and so we, I think next week's going to be a, a busy week for us. Um, and is there, is there anybody that, you know, I was thinking during our earlier meeting, if we could use some matching matching funds, you know, uh, I, don't, I don't know where the hell we'd get them from, but if we could get some grant money that to, to go to farms uh, where we could match it with uh, COVID-19 money, uh, you know, so we get, two bucks worth of use for a dollar or something like that. Um, I don't know if it would pay to, to get Gus back in to see if there's anything uh, through the ready program that uh, he or Ella know about. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I think we've got to chase the money. That's for sure. Well, the, the other thing is, you know, I really appreciate that Amanda brought this up. Like, the other thing is not hinging or delaying the money to help with some technical expertise, but, right. but potentially pairing it so that the money goes a little further, you know, um, and, and as she rightly said, the money's going to go out the door the minute they get it. I, I believe that. Um, but but sort of some, we're all aiming for sustainability and, and in a very volatile industry, particularly in dairy. And I've, I've been amazed that the, the, the farmer in Richmond that called me and was quite upset about our conversation a few weeks ago had diversified. <laughs> and so it was sort of like, well, this is, you're proving the point. And, and some of the farmers we heard from today, they're, they were glad to be, Will was glad that they had diversified. And, and I think we do have an obligation to, to help them pay their bills and help them do a little planning and it, to the, especially when they're asking for that help. I mean, so that's not a match as you're saying, Mr. Chair, but it is, no. but it is a, a pairing of, um, some of the, some of the money with, with also some technical assistance and not in a way that is, you know, gotta be, if you want this, you get that, but. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't have to be a mandate, but, um, uh, it, uh, it would be good to get that feedback, uh, Ruth. Yeah. I was just going to say that, um, what Amanda was saying about the programs at Cornell University for dairy, um, I've heard from farmers in my area too. They have some really, really strong programs already up and running that we don't have to pay for. We just need to provide access to them because um, they're expensive to get access to, but they're already there. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. And I think part of, you know, I had asked a couple of weeks ago if we could have Laura Ginsburg in to talk to her about that dairy innovation grant. Um, because that's six million bucks that's supposed to go regionally. Um, and I think creating these regional partnerships with, with uh, you know, services and uh, things that are already happening in our region with dairy would be helpful to Vermont dairy farmers um, to the extent that these things already exist um, that they just need access to. Um, so wondering what Laura's plans are. And I, I actually, now I, now I remember that you guys asked me to reach out to her. So I will do that again. <laughs> um, but, um, just 
wanting to not spend too much time reinventing the wheel when we have stuff right. out there. Yeah, uh, Brian. Yeah, I'll just note. I think we all got copied on this. I assume we did. Yeah. Uh, Anson Tevis had sent along uh, an email uh, this morning around nine about the um, financial relief package that's available for folks outside dairy. And you may want to take a look at that. There's some grants and uh, things available that uh, he found uh, going back here. Yeah, Most I will just know in our community. It's only $25,000. Well, I. I I understand, but I, so, I I'm no, going to side no, with the no, chair. <laughs> no, I'm going to I'm going to just mention that I think the chair's right. If we focused our efforts the next week or so on collecting all the money we could possibly find, uh, it's kind of like the old story about the couch, where the quarters slipped down and the dimes. And you know, if, if you pick all that money up, it's actual money. So th it may not help too many people, but it might help a few people and take the pressure off the other funding that we're gonna be required to, hey, let's be honest, we're gonna to have to make some really tough choices. Uh, if, the, if the 50 isn't 50, it's less than that. Um, it's gonna take some tough choices. That's all. I've, I've never, never been embarrassed reaching down and picking up a penny. Never bothered me in the least. Uh, but anyhow, um, we ought to get ready uh, for our session at 1130. Um, oh, yeah. And if, if any of you have got uh, ideas about uh, what, you know, anybody being on or what we should uh, work on the, on the schedule uh, for Tuesday or Wednesday uh, next week, uh, you know, be sure and let me or Linda know. And Michael, uh, good to see you. Uh, did you have, you've got a couple of projects you're working on for us? Sure, I just wanted to give you a status report. Um, I finished drafting the dairy assistance. I just finished drafting the agricultural producer and processor assistance program. Uh, the Work, farm worker retention program stays the same, but Treasury's issued some new guidance, uh, which may affect the eligibility for that program for CRF. Um, I have contacted John Sales at the Food Bank. He's going to get back to me with numbers and a proposal today. I talked to Stephanie and Jen Carby about funding Meals on Wheels, and that's about an appropriation and potentially using the, some of the CRF money for some of what was general fund money. And I think that that's probably eligible under the new Treasury guidance. I contacted Rosie at AOE. I haven't heard back from her. I'm not really surprised by that because she probably has channels that she has to work within if she's going to make any kind of official proposal. Um, so I'm going to draft something that's basically a, a general grant to the agency to do the summer food service program, and then a separate general grant for the food service um, employee benefits. I do think we need to talk at some point about whether or not that benefit, like the farm worker retention benefit, is going to qualify underneath the new CRF treasury guidance. Um, I have to digest that a little bit more. Uh, and that's kind of where I am. So I will have a draft for you either by the end of today or early Monday for you to look at. Um, it won't be proofed and edited, et cetera, but you'll at well, least be able to work. I don't think that's necessary yet until we get it sort of firmed up. And then, <clears throat> then ship it off to get straightened out. Okay. The other, the other thing you were kind of just talking about the business consulting. You had got a proposal from BHCB at one point. I've been in contact with them about how much money they would need to provide the COVID response assistance that they proposed. Um, is $192,000, and I have the language to include in the bill if you want me to include it in the bill. Yeah, um, 
Well, I think we we need to talk about that uh, to see uh, how in depth that would be and if it would cover the needs that, that we heard about this morning uh, from some of the witnesses. So, um, so we'll plan to do that Tuesday morning then. Is that okay with you, Michael? You'll be free? I, I think, I'm not sure if Lynn has already scheduled me, but she generally just blocks out my time yeah. on Tuesdays. And, um, She's to, a real hummer to work with, huh? Just blocks it out, doesn't he, mask? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'll be available. Yeah. Anything else from anybody? No, I'm going to go put a tie and jacket on. Yeah, I got to get ready. Um, well, have a good weekend, everybody, and thanks a lot for, for everything. We'll see you uh, in 10 minutes. You too, Bobby.